Hi everyone, this is Rabbi Rachel. I'm uh, recording this for all of you from my home office in Philadelphia. I miss seeing all of you a lot, but um, it's very nice to make this recording for you and I hope you enjoy it. So today what I wanted to focus on was the Akedah, the Binding of Isaac. So we're going to look at the original Tanakh text, the text from the Old Testament, the Torah. Um, and then after that, I want to look at some of the medieval commentators, the Miforshim. So these will be people like Rashi, who commented on every line of the entire Torah. Um, they're very wise, they had a lot of learning, and they really were very interested in um, the people in the Tanakh, their motivations, their interests, their desires. So we're going to get into a little bit of the psychology of Abraham, um, and even we're going to talk about God and what the story of the binding of Isaac says about God. So I would like to start with the blessing for Torah study. Um, you're welcome to follow along with me. It starts off just like the blessing for lighting candles. Um, and then instead of saying, L'hadlik ner shel Shabbat, we'll say, L'asok b'divrei Torah. So, Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam asher kidshanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. So it's my great pleasure to get to study a little bit of Torah with you. And if you ever want to talk over any of this more, please feel free to call over to the office and um, myself or Rabbi Grossman would love to talk to you. So I'm going to read just the first few lines in Hebrew and then we'll go into the English. Um, and this is for anyone who's looking for it. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 19. Vayehi achar hadvarim ha'ela, v'ha'elohim nisa et Avraham. Vayomer elav, Avraham, vayomer hineni. Vayomer kachna et bincha, et yechidcha, asher ahavta et yitzchak. Velech lecha el eretz hamoria, v'ha'alehu sham le'ola al echad heharim, asher omar elecha. So we'll now look at the English of those lines and we'll continue a little further in the story. Sometime afterward, God put Abraham to the test. He said to him, Abraham, and he answered, here I am. And he said, take your son, your favored one, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the heights that I will point out to you. So early next morning, Abraham saddled his ass and took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. He split the wood for the burnt offering and he set out the place set out for the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his servants, "You stay here with the ass, the boy and I will go up there. We will worship and we will return to you." Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and put it on his son Isaac. He himself took the firestone and the knife and the two walked off together. Then Isaac said to his father, to his father Abraham, Father, and he answered, Yes, my son. And he said, Here are the firestone and the wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will see to the sheep for his burnt offering, my son. And the two of them walked on together. They arrived at the place of which God had told him. Abraham built an offer there, he laid out the wood, he bound his son Isaac, he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to slay his son. Then an angel of the Lord called to him from the heavens, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not raise your hand against the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your favored one, from me. When Abraham looked up, his eye fell upon a ram, caught up in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. So obviously, this is a fairly complex narrative emotionally, right? The basic outline is narratively simple. God calls out to Abraham and says, you're going to sacrifice your son on top of a mountain in the land of Moriah. 
And uh, Abraham takes his son and his servants. He goes to that place. He takes his son up the mountain. He almost sacrifices his son, but at the last minute, an angel intervenes and sort of grabs his hand and says, don't kill the child. And Abraham instead sees a ram right nearby and sacrifices the ram instead. And we learn after this that Abraham has passed the test and he is rewarded. Now, for many of us with modern eyes, this is, of course, quite troubling, right? The idea of child sacrifice is anathema to the Jewish tradition. It is um, something that the rabbis revile. They say that it's what sets us apart from some of the neighboring countries in the ancient time. Um, and they would say that, you know, obviously we sacrifice animals but not children. And nowadays, of course... Jews don't even sacrifice animals. Um, so the story is really deeply troubling. How could Abraham do this? Why would God ask him to do this, right? Why would a just, compassionate God ask Abraham to sacrifice his son? Even though God stops it from fully happening, why would that be the test, right? That seems like an unreasonable test. So Interestingly enough, or perhaps obviously, the ancient rabbis also really struggled with this story. They found this story very difficult. And what that means is that we have many, many, many midrashim, many classical commentaries on the story where they're grappling with what's going on here. Um, I, of course, will not be covering all of those. I'm going to be looking at a specific period, a specific time period, which is the medieval writers, both because I think they're interesting and they sum up a lot of earlier works. Um, and even from those medieval writers, we don't have time to get into everything today, but I did a selection of things that I think you will find interesting. So to begin with, um, I want to look at a text from Rashi. Um, Rashi is one of the greatest commentators of the Jewish tradition. He commented on almost every line of the Tanakh. Um, and he had a great mind for Midrash, so he had memorized many of the earlier commentaries that existed. So he first looks at um, this question of why did God feel the need to test Abraham and why was this the test? And why is there why is there so much confusion, right? Why does God say, go to this mountain, I'll show you the mountain when you get there? So here's what Rashi says. Echad heharim, hakadosh baruch hu mathe had sadikim, veachar kach migalel lahem, vechol zeh kadei leharbot sacharan, vechen el haaretz asher areka, so Rashi says, why does God say, go to one of the mountains that I will show you? Why doesn't God just say, go to, you know, mountain so-and-so? The Holy One, blessed be he, first makes the righteous expectant and only afterwards discloses fully to them his intention. And all this in order to augment their reward. And then Rashi brings up two other examples of this similar principle. So what he says here is that the reason God makes things complicated is to add to their zechut, their reward, or their merit, their sachar, their wages, also their reward. Um, so this ties into a biblical or a rabbinic concept, which is that human beings go through trials in life so that they can have a greater reward in the afterlife. So in this commentary, Rashi is going to give us a lot of different answers. But in this commentary, what Rashi is saying is that Abraham was given a test, and not just a test, a kind of ambiguous, unclear test, so that he would get a greater reward in the world to come. So Ibn Ezra, another medieval commentator, who was a little bit later and lived in Spain, he also is going to talk about this concept of merit and zechut. So what he says is, God tested him so he would receive merit. Um, and the meaning of because now I know is like, and if not, I will know. So what he's saying is that God needs to add to Abraham's zechut. 
The problem that Ibn Ezra is stuck on is God knows everything. God knew what Abraham was going to do from the start. So why do this? Ah, it's to add to Abraham's merit so that he gets a better reward in the world to come. These are interesting ideas. They are not the worst thing I have heard, but nor are they my favorite, right? I'm unsatisfied by the idea that we go through terrible things in order to get a better reward in the world to come. It doesn't, I think that is a very satisfying answer to some people and that's great. Personally for me, not so satisfying. So another one that I find interesting, excuse me, is the idea that, in fact, Isaac consented to this test. This comes up in a few places. Ibn Ezra says at one point, yachdav belev shave. What does it mean that the two of them went together? It means that he went with a full heart, that Isaac knew what was going on and he was okay with it. So in this explanation, we get the idea that it's really okay because Isaac knew what he was getting into. He was willing to sacrifice himself for God. Also an interesting idea, not my favorite, but interesting. So now we're going to get a little bit more complicated. I want to bring in a commentary from Ramban, also known as Nachmanides. Um, he lived in Provence. He was a later medieval commentator. Okay. So Ramban says, A God tested Abraham. The core matter of this test is, in my opinion, to show that a person has absolute authority to perform an action. One can do what he wants and not do what one doesn't want. So what Ramban is saying here is that, in fact, this is an example of free will, right? That we might think that everything is predetermined. God knows everything. Everything is going to happen in a certain way. But in fact, human beings have free will. So this is a common rabbinic idea that part of what separates angels from humanity is that human beings are able to actually act and move in the world, whereas angels can only do a prescribed thing. They don't have free will. And that God in some way desires this interaction with humanity and desires interaction with a free human being. So Abraham, in this case, is given a test to act on his own free will. And then Ibn Ezra goes on to say that something that it seems like a test to the person being tested, from the point of view of God, is not really a test at all, right? It's really to show that a person can act out what God already knows the person will act out. So the medieval commentators were very interested in the difference between potentiality and actuality, they thought something didn't really count if it was just possible. So even if I know that I'm going to go to a Kabbalat Shabbat service later, it doesn't actually matter until you do it. So from God's perspective, even if God knows that Abraham was always going to do it, it doesn't really matter until Abraham does it. I think this is a little different than how we in the modern world interact with um, our behaviors. But for the medieval commentators, this idea of potentiality versus actuality was very important. So I want to do one last small um, line of commentary, and then we'll get into what I find actually to be the most interesting line of commentary. So this one is back to Rashi, and he's focusing on uh, one line that God says, Ki ata yadati. Ki ata yadati, me ata yesh li ma... Hang on, sorry, my Hebrew got all scrambled. There we go. 
מעתה יש לי מה להשיב לשטן ולאומות. הטמיעיהם מה היא חיבתי אצלך. יש לי פתחון פה עכשיו שרואים כי ירא אלוהים אתה. For now I know. So he's commenting, what does God now know? Rashi is saying, God knows everything already. It's not actually about what God knows. God is saying, from now I have a reply to give to Satan and to the nations who wonder at the love I bear you. I have an excuse, a reason to tell them now that they see that you are a God-fearing man. So um, Rashi imagines God talking to Abraham and saying, I, of course, knew that you were going to do this, but I had to prove to Satan and to the other nations how much you loved me. And the only way to do that was to have you go through this test. So you'll see in a few different... Um, in a few different commentaries, this idea that Satan in some way plays into the story. Maybe Satan bothered God, as we might see in the book of Job, um, or maybe God just wanted to prove something to Satan that God already knew. Um, I think this is an interesting idea because it discusses, it sticks with this idea that God knows everything, which I think is quite important to the medieval commentators and to many people's modern theology. And it throws in this element of God proving, of human actions needing to happen to prove something to someone else. So God knows everything, but God needs to prove it to other people. An interesting idea. For our final commentary, um, I'm going to bring in two. One from Rashi and one from a less well-known author who is Ralbag, also known as Gersonides. So Rashi goes back up to the top, and he looks at this term, v'ha'alehu. V'ha'alehu, um, on a simple translation, on what can be known as a pshat level, the like, basic meaning of the text, means sacrifice him, sacrifice him. Um, it has the shoresh, um, ayin lamed he, which means to bring up. If you've ever heard the term to make aliyah, to move to Israel, it means going up to Israel. Um, but in the hefeel form, which is a certain form in Hebrew, it means to offer up, right? To burn up a sacrifice. So it seems like God is saying to uh, Abraham, burn him up there as a sacrifice. But Rashi is going to look at it a little differently. V'ha'alehu, lo amar lo shechatehu lefi shelo haya chafetz hakadosh baruch hu l'shechato אלה להעלהו להר לאסרתו עולה, ומי שהעלהו אמר להורידהו. So, and offer him. God did not say slay him, right? God never uses the term slay. God just says, bring him up. Because the Holy One, blessed be he, did not desire that he should slay him. But he told him to bring him up to the mountain to prepare a burnt offering. So when he had taken him up, God said to him, bring him back down. <coughs> so what Rashi is saying here, he's making a bit of a pun. He's looking at the term ha'alehu, which is the he feel, the active form of Allah. So usually we would translate that as sacrifice him. And Rashi is saying, no, 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 it just means bring him up to the top of the mountain, right? So Rashi is saying, Abraham, in fact, was confused. God never wanted a sacrifice in the first place. God just wanted Abraham to bring up his son to the top of the mountain, teach his son how to do a burnt offering, right? They're going to sacrifice an animal together on the top of this mountain and then come back down. And that's what God wanted all along. So I think we can learn something interesting about Midrash here, which is that the commentators feel very little need to have internal consistency. Right? So in one place, Rashi is going to say that this is all about Satan. In another place, Rashi is going to say that Abraham was confused. And in a third place, Rashi is going to say that um, this was all to help Abraham in the afterlife. I think that our ancient rabbis were very comfortable with um, multiplicity. They were very comfortable having many ideas and opinions out on the table 
and leaving it a bit unresolved and saying, each person can decide from themselves what interpretation is their favorite. Now, when it came to halakha, to Jewish law, they wanted to find an answer. And sometimes they would argue about which uh, line of commentary was the best. But ultimately, they recorded all of them, and they were comfortable sharing all of them. So this last one is from Raul Bag, Gersonides. Um, Raul Bag in Hebrew, Gersonides in uh, Greek. And this expands upon what Rashi is telling us. So Gersonides is actually um, my medieval professor, my medieval studies professor, uh, wrote his dissertation on Gersonides. Um, Gersonides was a, a follower of Maimonides. Now, Maimonides was the great rationalist, right? He brought together science and philosophy and religion. He really loved rationality. Um, and Gersonides also loved that rationality and was often much more willing than Maimonides was to make bold claims and to say things that might have made people very uncomfortable. So Gersonides is one of our most upfront, honest medieval commentators. Many other commentators were concerned that if they shared something that was too risky, um, people who they thought weren't as smart as them might rebel. So they were very concerned about that. Gersonides didn't have that fear. It did get him in trouble, in fact. Um, and just to be clear, he didn't live at the same time as Maimonides. He just read everything that Maimonides wrote. He lived about 100 years later. So, here's what he says. The matter of the test is, in my opinion, that the prophecy came to him ambiguously. When God said to Abraham, bring up Isaac and bring up a sacrifice, it is possible that this saying could be understood as sacrifice him, as bring up a sacrifice with him and offer him as an offering. Or that he could bring him there to sacrifice something in order to educate Isaac in the worship of God. So Ralbag starts off by saying that the real test is that the prophecy was ambiguous. So when he's talking about the prophecy, he's saying the moment when um, Abraham received these words from God. And he's saying that, in fact, these words were ambiguous. So for Gersonides and for Maimonides, a prophecy was very rarely a vision right before your eyes. Generally, it was a moment of insight, a moment of clarity, of understanding. And so they said that Abraham has this moment of prophecy, this moment of insight, that he needs to bring his son up to the mountain for something sacrificial. But he doesn't quite get it. And in fact, God is doing this on purpose. God wants to see whether Abraham has the wisdom to figure out that he shouldn't sacrifice his son, that this is not what God would really want of him. That in fact, what God wants is just education and learning, right? And that God is seeing whether Abraham can follow this discernment process. So Gersonides is going to go on to explore how much people rush while they're trying to understand something. How they often are like, well, it appears to me that this is what is true, and so I have to go based on that. And Gersonides, in fact, wants us all to move much more slowly and carefully. He wants us to say, okay, so you had a moment of insight. You had a moment of clarity. Think on it for a little while. Take your time. Check out whether that really sits well with you, whether that really seems ethical, whether a God that is ethical and all compassionate and all knowing would really want that of you, right? So Gersonides is going to encourage us to take things really slowly. And he's using Abraham as an example, in fact, of someone who ultimately made the right choice. So as he goes on in his writings, he'll say that Abraham, over the course of the travel, was learning more and more. And the ram, in fact, was there all the time, but Abraham wasn't ready to see it. He thought that he had to prove himself to God by making a terrible choice. He wasn't ready to say, oh, maybe there's other ways 
to prove my faith, my emunah. And it wasn't until he was up on that mountain that an angel came to him and he saw the ram. For Gersonides, this angel is another moment of insight, another moment of clarity, where Abraham realized that he could live his life in a different way. He didn't have to sacrifice the entirety of his love in order to show God how much he loved God. So um, I'm checking if there's anything else to share with you from this Gersonides. Yeah. So Grisanides said, And God, may he be exalted, tested him to see whether there would be nothing that God commanded that he could not understand. Ultimately, he would understand from it that he should sacrifice there a different offering, not that he should sacrifice his son. Okay. So I want to conclude, actually, with a little bit of learning from my own mother. Um, many of you might know that my mother, Adina Davidson, lives in Cleveland, Ohio. And she's actually a psychotherapist. And she recently um, was certified to become a Jungian analyst. If there's any, in the tradition of Carl Jung, if there's anything that takes longer than studying to become a rabbi, it's studying to become an analyst. And she actually analyzed parental sacrifice as the um, core of her thesis. So when she looks at the story of Abraham, she says that what he's learning is how to not sacrifice his child, right? That's actually, she would agree in many ways with Gersonides, that the test is to learn to not sacrifice your kid. What she'll say is that, in fact, it's very tempting when you become a parent, and I'm not a parent yet, but she obviously is, it's very tempting when you become a parent to feel like you need to, um, that there are many things that are more important than your child, and you have to give them all, you have to either give up your kid or give up everything else that, that is important to you, right? That you need to give up your entire job to become a parent, or you need to have no relationship with your children and work extremely hard all the time. Or perhaps we need to be like monks, right? We can never have children so that we have a full relationship with God. And she says that, in fact, Abraham learns and many good parents learn that, in fact, it's always about having a balance between the things that are important in your life, like having a job, like spirituality, like creativity and the arts and intellectual pursuit, and the sacrifices you have to make to raise a child because children need you to sacrifice some parts of your life. <coughs> so my hope for all of you as we go in this week is that you have that time to look for clarity, to see what's really important to you, to perhaps see what parts of your life actually you need to sacrifice and get rid of, and what parts of your life, in fact, you need to allow to flourish and to grow, and that you have that space to see what will really bring you closer to God or really bring you into the highest, um, the highest living of your values. So I hope that you all have a good week, that you're finding ways to stay connected to people who are important in your life and to stay entertained in a time that can be a bit boring. And please, if you ever want to talk, if there's ever anything Rabbi Grossman or I can help you with, please feel free to give us a call at our office. We would always love to hear from you. Have a good afternoon.